Hello, my AP Calc AB students. Welcome to our first video that covers really topics six, seven, and six, eight. I'm gonna mix those two guys together. It really doesn't matter <laughs> if you are aware of which one corresponds to which topic, but if you're curious, we're actually gonna take care of a little bit of 6.8 first and then move into the idea of 6.7. But all you need to worry about is this series of videos over the next couple of sequences are going to all talk about how to take the antiderivative of an expression. Big day for you guys if you're watching these videos because you're, you're, you're going to learn how to integrate. You're finally going to see this other branch of calculus that I've been so eagerly anticipating you guys to experience. So with that, let's take a look. So what we've got going on is a conglomeration of the fundamental theorem of calculus. It's going to come back here in just a little bit, but really we're going to take a look at some examples that deal with finding antiderivatives of what we call indefinite integrals. You're going to look at your basic rules. And one of the things that I like to do to start off class is even before my students might even look at their notes. So if you're watching this at home, you might have these notes in front of you. Maybe you don't. So this could be kind of exciting. But if I ask you, hey, suppose that we want to find a function who's got a derivative of 3x squared. I wouldn't mind if you guys even paused the video, thought about that for about 30 seconds, and then came back and joined me. All right, I know you all paused the video, and I bet maybe some of you even came up with, if not all of you, came up with an answer to this. And the answer to this elusive capital F of X might be X to the third power, right? Am I, am I right? If you take the derivative of X cubed, you certainly find yourself back at 3X squared. I didn't really do a good job of teaching how that would come about, but we'll get there. But I want to point something out here. It says that there are actually many, many answers. Only x cubed is one of them. Any of these following functions could potentially be functions who have a derivative of 3x squared, right? Derivative of x cubed plus 1, derivative of x cubed minus 7, both of those have an answer of 3x squared. And if you, for that matter, just say x cubed plus any old c, any old constant, would still have that derivative. So that's going to be really important, this plus c that's just going to kind of gnaw away at you. And you'll just have to remember to throw that in all your answers. So we'll talk about that coming up as well. But we have a new kind of notation. The integration symbol is certainly not new to you by now, but instead of writing what function would have a derivative of f of x, that's pretty wordy, isn't it? We just write this, integrate f of x with respect to x, or the integral of f of x with respect to x. And generally, we will say that the integral of f of x with respect to x is capital f of x plus some constant c. So note, you must always write a plus c after your integral's answer. Another thing I want to bring up, a lot of times we will interchangeably use the words integral and antiderivative. I know that there are some people out there, some teachers that may watch this, that say, no, 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 you can't do that. You've got to be really careful. But I think for the math that we are teaching, it's not going to do a disservice to our students. I like to use the words a little bit interchangeably, but you're just doing the opposite of what your differentiation process was, anti-differentiation, finding these integrals. All right, basic integral rules. Well, these are probably not going to be a big surprise. I bet five of them won't be a big surprise. If you integrate zero, which um, let me tell you, it's never going to happen. But if it did, you're just going to get a constant. Because integrating zero is kind of like uh, what would be there on the page if there's nothing to integrate, right? But that would be a true case because the constant's derivative would be zero. Now, what if you integrate a constant? called k. Well, that would give you k times whatever variable you're taking your integral with respect to. Most of the time it's x, and then you have your plus c. If we take the derivative of kx plus c, hopefully you see that you would have k when you integrated with, or when you took the derivative with respect to x, that is. So the integral of 2 with respect to x is 2x plus c. 
If you integrate with a constant in front of a function, just pull that constant out in front and then deal with the integration of that function using some of the rules that we're about to see. Four, four and five are probably no-brainers to you. You can integrate across the sum or a difference by splitting apart the two separate integrations. But I want to bring your attention to number six. This is the big dog. If I had a graph it of a big dog, I would have put it right here. Maybe I'll do that next year. He is the one. He is the driving formula that's going to get you through the majority of the problems in this lesson. If you're integrating an x raised to a power, and you are going to be able to use this formula for every single n that can possibly exist that's a real number except for negative one that's the only one right and we'll deal with it later but if n is anything besides negative one this formula will work and all you do is you take your x and raise it to a power one higher than what that n was and then just make sure that that power finds itself in the denominator Remember our example up here, this 3x squared? Let's give it a look. If we integrate 3x squared with respect to x, the 3 is a constant that we just throw in front. We integrate the x squared, and according to our formula, is x to the third over 3. Don't forget your plus c. Bam! And there we go. And it's going to be that easy. Why don't we take a look at a few examples? Integrate 3 times x, a little similar to the one that we just did. Again, the 3 comes out in front. You're thinking about just integrating x, at which point we can get right into that. That would be x to the second, all over 2. At this point, I don't care if you put that whole thing over 2, if you just put the x squared over 2. This is perfectly acceptable. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, you might see multiple choice problems that might put the coefficient as three halves and then an x squared after that. All are fine. Take a look at part B. One over x cubed. Now, what you cannot do is just expect to integrate the one by itself and then integrate the x cubed by itself and then throw them back together in a fraction. That will never work. What you need to do is rewrite this so that you have an x to a power. And that power in this case is negative 3, as you can see. And now we can use our rule, because that rule works for any power of x besides... That's right, good job, you remembered, negative 1. Negative 1 is the only one that doesn't work for. So, and we'll talk about why that's the case in a very... Uh, future video uh, coming in the near future. So for this problem, we're going to take x and raise it up to a power. Now you're in the negative number world, right? Negative number worlds, tricky world. I've been there. I've lived there. It's kind of backwards, right? So what happens is that if you're at negative 3 and you want to add, you're going to be moving to the right. So you're going to call that power a negative 2. And that answer is perfectly fine. It's just probably not real pretty as far as what we might want to see in a multiple choice. So I might float the negative to the front, drop that 2, and then maybe put the x to the positive 2 uh, down in the bottom with that plus c, and that might look a little bit better. All right. At any point, if you feel like, hey, I might want to try one of these on my own, pause that video, work through it, and then resume the video and see how you did. I promise you, you will start to grasp this a lot faster the sooner you start taking the reins and ownership of this learning instead of just kind of sitting back as a participant and watching me. It's not a bad idea to watch me if you can't do the work on your own as, as in, in addition. It's the, it's the next best thing. But if you can try some of these, it's certainly going to be to your benefit. Square root of x, also known as x to the 1 half. All right, so sometimes, yes, we do have fractional exponents. So you're going to add 1 to 1 half. Let's go ahead and write that as a mixed, or not as a mixed, but as an improper fraction. And then we'll put that over that same 3 halves. And there's nothing wrong with that answer. It's perfectly suitable for a correct answer. But it's likely that we might want to flip that 3 halves and multiply it by our x to the 3 halves and make it look like that. Next up, 
letter D. Once again, don't try to take the integral of this piece and this piece and multiply them together. We have one rule. One rule is all we have, and that is you can either integrate a constant or you can integrate x to a power. I guess that's two rules. You can integrate an x to a power, but that's a lot more than just an x to a power. So we're going to go ahead and simplify this. x to the cubed root is kind of like dreaming about being called x to the one-third. So if I distribute him through, x to the one-third times x is x to the four-thirds. And 4 times x to the one-third is 4x to the one-third. Now I have two terms with these lousy fractional exponents. But hey, we'll get over it. We're calc students. We can handle this. So if we raise four-thirds up one power, four-thirds plus one, four-thirds plus three-thirds is seven-thirds, you're going to get awfully good at adding one to some fractions, trust me. And then we drop down our minus plop in our 4 constant, and then do the same thing. x to the 1 third integrated. Raise that up 1. 1 third becomes 4 thirds. We put a 4 thirds here in the denominator. We basically have a correct answer. But if we want to make this look a little bit better, multiply by the reciprocal. This would be a 3 sevenths. Multiply by the reciprocal. Now if you see, the 4s are going to cancel. If this 4 thirds becomes a 3 over 4, all I would have left was a 3. And I'm going to leave the answer like this. Yes, I could factor out a 3. I could probably factor out an x to the 4 thirds. I could do that and say, I'm not going to worry about having it factor out of the c, and I'll put my parentheses ending here. Not something I'm really interested in. You can leave it like that. A problem like e oftentimes tricks my students because you tend to sometimes they they tend to sometimes do some of the same things that they tried to do with the earlier derivative days and take the uh, integral at the top and the integral at the bottom and we just can't do that so what we're going to do is we're going to split this apart into x plus one over x to the half and just make sure that it is simplified accordingly so by splitting this i'm talking about the x dividing by x to the half, and the 1 dividing by x to the half. Now, I still probably ought to do another step of algebra. So that would be x to the 1 over x to the half is x to the half, and 1 over x to the half is x to the negative half. Now I have my variable raised to a power format that I can use my formula for. Now, if anyone was saying, hey, now wait a minute, wait a minute here, could I take that x to the half pop it up to the numerator, multiply it by x plus 1. Is that a thing? Can I do that? Is that legal? Won't that give you the same result? So of course you can do that if you think that that's better. Now my blue calculus step is going to give me x to the 3 halves on top over 3 halves. And then this one's kind of interesting. When you add 1 to negative half, careful, you get positive half. You're going to see that quite a bit. You're going to integrate 1 over square root of x from time to time, so you want to get very comfortable with that step. We have a correct answer here, but I'll be honest, it looks a little bit better if we clean it up just a smidge as such. There we go. Some of you might have noticed, check this out. Each time I had a fractional denominator, it started right here. Had another one there, had another one there, had another one there, had another one there. You can notice that each time those will get reciprocated and become the coefficient. Now, of course, over here I had a little simplifying happening. And over here, the 1 over 2 becomes a 2 over 1. So if you want to eliminate this whole, hmm, divide by the fraction step, you might be able to do these in one less step. And so you're welcome to do that. And finally, for our problem F here, we have a bit of work that we need to do on this, and that will come in the way of expanding this out. There is no way in Calc 2, Calc 3, Calc 4, Calc 27, if you go that far, that you're really going to be able to take this integral without expanding it, without foiling it out. 
So I don't have a trick up my sleeve later on that's going to circumvent this. So we'll just do that. It doesn't take much to multiply this binomial times itself. I know that we're taking this integral with respect to t, which is a little weird, but just go with the flow. The variable is going to be t that you write each time. So integrate t to the fourth. That would be t to the fifth over 5. Integrate 2 t squared, that's 2t to the third over 3. And if you integrate 1 with respect to t, remember that's a constant, k, with respect to t, you get k times t, or 1 times t, which is just t here. And don't forget your plus c. There's really nothing wrong with this answer, but again, oftentimes you see them written with coefficients out in front of the variables. It doesn't take very long for you to become pretty darn good at using this general power rule, but you want to practice. You make sure that you spend the time on the skill builder that I gave you so that you can really get these easy ones down so that when integration starts to get a little bit trickier, you're going to be ready for it. Thanks for joining. Stick around in the next video. We're going to talk about taking the integrals of trigonometric words. We'll see you then.